Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's talk. We will get started momentarily after we give another minute or so for people to log on. We thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I think I'm on, and if I am, uh, I'm Steve Goldstein, and I'm the director of the uh, Taiwan Studies Workshop at uh, Harvard. Uh, very pleased today to have uh, a speaker who uh, I actually read much of his work uh, before he even came to Harvard. Uh, I, he was one of the most prolific graduate students on Taiwan studies uh, that I had ever encountered, and we were really pleased to have him join us. He spent this year as a Ho family fellow in T Taiwan studies. Uh, he, um, his work uh, has been, well, on everything about uh, Taiwan. Uh, but uh, predominantly social movements uh, within the context of political participation and uh, political parties. Uh, the, this is part of a, what I think what he's going to present today. We, I'll let him introduce it, but it's, I think, part of a larger study uh, that's being done of public opinion in, in Taiwan. So I am honestly very pleased uh, to introduce Lev and to give him the floor. Thank you very much, Steve, for the very kind introduction. And thank you everyone for joining today. Um, first of all, uh, I do not have COVID, but unfortunately I have a bit of a nasty head cold. So if I sound a little bit under the weather, that's why and I might be pausing frequently to, to uh, hydrate. So please pardon me. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about what is uh, an ongoing large uh, survey project um, that I've been working on over the last uh, two to three years. Uh, now, why is unification so unpopular in Taiwan is the title of today's talk, but that's really only going to be one of uh, the topics I'm going to touch on today. Uh, today I'm going to present uh, a few of the main findings from a few different topics that are all uh, connected to the larger survey project that I've been working on uh, in Taiwan. So to begin with, I want this to be super clear that I am lucky to be working on an absolute rock star of a team uh, with three other scholars on this project. Uh, this has uh, become really a, a project of, of love for the four of us. Um, Shelley Rigger, who in the world of Taiwan politics needs no introduction, uh, along with two other graduate student uh, colleagues of mine from UC Irvine, John Mock in sociology, and Nathan Chan in political science. Now, to give a little bit of background about how we started uh, getting interested in doing survey work in Taiwan, uh, originally we were doing survey work in Hong Kong, looking at political participation in Hong Kong. But ever since the anti-extradition uh, movement began, along with the, uh, the new national security law, uh, we've actually stopped conducting public opinion surveys in Hong Kong, and instead we've focused our attention uh, to Taiwan. And there's a tie into that later that I'll get to. Uh, this is the first major survey that we conducted in Taiwan. Uh, it was conducted in May of 2021, and uh, it was done at the National uh, Dengzhi University in Taiwan uh, Polkrisi Lab. Our, we had a thousand respondents, and our topics touched on a range of issues from identity to Hong Kong to military threats and to COVID-19. And today I'm gonna to talk about these first three. Uh, I have some slides about our COVID-19 results ready for anyone who's interested during the Q&A, uh, but I'm mostly gonna focus on these first three. Uh, and I'd first like to talk a little bit about the survey uh, and the sample that we have uh, and how it compares to kind of the larger Taiwanese population. So uh, the, uh, pie chart on the left is our survey and the pie chart on the right is the NCCU national survey that's regularly conducted throughout the year. 
Uh, and we find a very similar demographic breakdown between who identified as Taiwanese, who identified as Chinese, and who identified as both. Uh, it's no shocker if you follow Taiwanese politics and Taiwanese public opinion uh, that the number of people who identify as exclusively Taiwanese has only gone up. Uh, and we see this both in the national survey and in our own sample as well. Uh, we also see very much, and this is a very important reoccurring theme uh, throughout uh, the various results, is that the number of Taiwanese who identify as exclusively Chinese uh, is very low uh, and is only uh, continuing to shrink as, as time goes on. Uh, in terms of political makeup, uh, I have two charts here. The first one on the left is our survey makeup. Uh, so uh, about 20% of our respondents uh, identified at, with the KNT, about 25 with the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP, and about 30% uh, were independent. Uh, and this is about, uh, you know, given that there's some other political parties on the pan blue side and the pan green side, uh, we're pretty pleased with this result because this really kind of uh, matches up with what we saw in the 2020 party vote results. So on the right is how Taiwanese citizens voted for their party vote uh, in the 2020 election, which again was about one third DPP, one third KMT, and one third uh, other parties. Um, so overall, we feel very confident that the sample we ended up with uh, in this survey being uh, fairly representative of uh, what we see in larger uh, surveys in Taiwan. And with that, I'm going to start with uh, our first question. Why is unification so unpopular? Now, of course, in Taiwanese politics, the question that everyone is constantly concerned with uh, is the fundamental defining feature of Taiwanese politics, which is how do Taiwanese people relate to China? Uh, and how do they feel about Taiwan's future uh, in connection to China? Uh, do people identify as Taiwanese? Do they identify as Chinese or both? Do people support independence? Do they support unification? And what do these things mean? Um, and uh, as time goes on, the meaning of what it means to want independence or to be Taiwanese, of course, is a changing and dynamic question. Uh, and uh, there's mountains of scholarship on Taiwanese identity and what this all means. Uh, and one kind of conventional common wisdom you hear increasingly uh, from more pro-Taiwan uh, voices, especially pro-Taiwanese independence voices, uh, is that Taiwanese culture has this more ethno-nationalist uh, angle to it, that there's something uh, unique about Taiwanese culture that makes it separate from Chinese culture, and that people who identify as Taiwanese uh, see themselves as culturally distinct from Chinese culture. Uh, now, even though uh, this is uh, uh, something that you hear from, from some pro independence groups, uh, what our survey finds, uh, oh, excuse me, is actually uh, that there's far more connection to Chinese culture from Taiwanese uh, citizens than we would actually expect. Uh, in our sample, of, which again, a thousand people, 56% uh, of Taiwanese uh, in our total sample uh, said that they felt some connection to uh, Chinese culture. Uh, and we were very specific with our wording in this question. We used Zhong Guo Wen Hua. And what's interesting is if you first look at the graph on the left, when we look at our different age breakdowns, uh, is that at least 50% uh, see that there is a cultural similarity between Taiwan and China, except for the 30 to 39 age group. Uh, even the youngest uh, cohort, the 20 to 29s, we were surprised to see uh, a, such a high percentage uh, still say that they found some sort of similarity culturally between uh, Taiwan and China. Uh, and to the right, uh, you again see uh, people who identify as Taiwanese are, of course, less likely uh, to find a cultural connection to China. Um, but you do not see the kind of outright rejection that you might uh, anticipate uh, seeing when you ask this kind of question. So we see that, you know, when it comes to this uh, cultural connection, uh, there's not really a, a lot of evidence from our survey that supports this idea that uh, people in Taiwan see themselves as completely culturally separate from Chinese culture, or that, uh, that we don't really find support for this kind of ethno-nationalist understanding of what it means to be uh, culturally Taiwanese. What we do find, however, uh, is that uh, there is a very strong rejection for political support for the PRC. Uh, in line with what we see from NCCU's uh, independence, unification, and status quo polling, um, which continually shows that more and more Taiwanese uh, are against any kind of unification with the PRC, uh, we see that uh, people in Taiwan uh, are increasingly against any sort of uh, appro approving attitude uh, or desire to unify uh, with the PRC. What's interesting is you first look on the left with our age cohort breakdown uh, is that 
every age range, even older generations, had more negative perceptions of the PRC uh, than positive. Uh, I think there's some common wisdom that would predict that older cohorts in Taiwan may have more favorable views of the PRC, uh, but our survey suggests uh, otherwise. Um, on the right, again, you see uh, very low support uh, or assessment of the PRC government and its people um, sort of across the board. Uh, and this in other questions was reflected as well. Um, we found that 66% uh, of our total respondents rated the PRC's influence, PRC's influence on Taiwan uh, as somewhat or very negative. Uh, and less than 10% of our respondents thought that China had any sort of positive impact on Taiwan. So what this kind of tells us is, first of all, something that most surveys continuously point to over the years, which is that Taiwanese emphatically do not want unification with the PRC, not because, though, of this sort of uh, idea of a cultural disconnect between Taiwan and China. Instead, it's a very clear political disconnect. Uh, Taiwanese certainly do not want to be governed by the PRC because they do not see the PRC as a good government, they don't see it in a positive light, and they see the PRC as bad for Taiwan. Uh, something else we asked when we were asking about cultural connections uh, was to ask Taiwanese people to uh, uh, how they felt about connections to Hong Kong. Uh, the graph on the left is Hong Kong and the graph on the right is the one I had earlier. Uh, and we actually find that Taiwanese respondents felt a, or at least responded more positively to a cultural connection to China than to Hong Kong. Uh, and, you know, we, we didn't press this question further in our survey, but I think it's interesting to at least hypothesize about why this might be. Uh, I think there's some good uh, reasons to think that Hong Kong's uh, political development being so separate from Taiwan's and the uh, history of British colonialism uh, might make some Taiwanese respondents feel less connected to Hong Kong uh, than they do the PRC. But the reason uh, we bring up Hong Kong is because the next main portion of our survey was about how Taiwanese felt about Hong Kong. Um, now, of course, I, I, I hope that most in the audience are at least fairly aware of uh, the ongoing uh, struggle for Hong Kong civil society in light of the national security law. Um, but of course, this issue has been present in Taiwanese civil society and Taiwanese politics uh, ever since it began in 2019. Uh, what's interesting is that if you were to look at the political messaging from uh, President Tsai and her party's response to the Hong Kong, to the ongoing Hong Kong uh, struggles against the national security law, is you would assume that Taiwan would be overwhelmingly open to helping and supporting Hong Kongers. Uh, and Tsai and, and uh, her party have actually done a number of very productive, positive steps in order to support Hong Kongers. Uh, one of which, for example, was the opening of a new uh, immigration office in Taiwan that was specifically aimed at helping Hong Kongers uh, immigrate to Taiwan. Uh, a previous survey that I conducted before this survey, uh, we even found that Hong Kongers, uh, if they planned to leave Hong Kong, their first choice of destination was Taiwan. Uh, so it made sense that uh, we asked Taiwanese people uh, how they feel about this potential influx of Hong Kongers coming uh, to Taiwan in light of both the protests uh, and Hong Kongers' uh, direct attitudes of wanting to move to Taiwan. And what we find is that uh, support for Hong Kongers in Taiwan is actually much more complicated uh, than sort of the very positive messaging you see from the Thai government. Um, now, if we start with the graph on the left, what we see is uh, unsurprising and a, a outward overwhelming amount of support for the anti-extradition movement, the protests that were ongoing from 2019 to 2020. Um, you see a very, only 15% did not express support for the protests. Um, but when it comes to whether or not Taiwan had a responsibility to assist Hong Kongers, you start to see a much more varied response. Uh, Taiwanese are less enthusiastic about uh, explicitly uh, expressing uh, the idea that Taiwan needs to intervene on behalf of Hong, uh, uh, Hong Kongers, even though a lot of the political messaging from the Tsai campaign uh, seemed to insinuate otherwise. And we're very curious about this, like why exactly it would be uh, that Taiwanese would be less enthusiastic about helping Hong Kongers, uh, even though they clearly are okay with expressing clear uh, messages of solidarity. Um, and to better understand just exactly how this support for Hong Kongers varied, we asked a series of questions about different policies uh, that Taiwanese would be supportive of uh, for Hong Kongers. Um, for example, we asked the right to vote, the right to migrate to Taiwan, and the right to purchase housing. 
Um, so I'll start with the right to purchase housing. Now this had a very low level of support. And the reason we asked this question is because uh, in Taiwan specifically, when there was a lot of kind of public discussion about the idea of Hong Kongers moving to Taiwan, uh, economic anxieties was really kind of at the forefront of why a number of Taiwanese were very skeptical at the idea of Hong Kongers moving to Taiwan. And I'll talk more about that uh, in the next slide. Uh, but the idea of wealthy Hong Kongers coming to Taiwan and purchasing land and making it more difficult for Taiwanese to purchase land, especially in Taipei, where land housing is incredibly expensive, uh, was a legitimate concern for a lot of Taiwanese when it came to whether or not to allow uh, Hong Kongers to migrate. Excuse me. But we did at the very least see uh, a actual bump in percentage of support for uh, the right to migrate um, at 36%. But 36% is still uh, lower than what we expected, uh, given kind of the outpour of positive messaging uh, from a whole host of political parties in Taiwan. What our most interesting finding though was, is that the right to vote was actually relatively high. Uh, and how we interpret this uh, as a form of uh, civic nationalism from Taiwan, which is to say that even though Taiwanese may not be overly enthusiastic at the idea of Hong Kongers moving to Taiwan uh, and gaining access uh, to uh, Taiwanese institutions, uh, if Hong Kongers are able to do so and are able to live in Taiwan, that at the very least they should eventually be able to have the right to be citizens of Taiwan, um, which we see as a, 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 a uh, positive uh, outlook for, at the very least, for Taiwanese support uh, for Hong Kongers in the future. But we also asked, you know, going back to this idea of economic anxiety, we're really curious about uh, how uh, Taiwanese saw the idea of Hong Kongers coming to Taiwan. Uh, and we really see a varied response. Uh, the question on the left, what kind of effect will Hong Kongers have over my personal economic status? Uh, we saw um, not nearly as much of a positive outlook uh, as you might expect. In fact, the negative uh, response uh, on is almost at the positive response. Uh, but what we do see is that Hong Kongers will be helpful to Taiwan's uh, national economy. We see a bigger percentage of people agreeing with this idea, uh, which tells us that uh, when it comes to how Taiwanese feel this economic anxiety, that even though they might personally not benefit from Hong Kongers coming to Taiwan, uh, they at the very least are able to see uh, that there might be some national effect uh, on, the Hong, on Hong Kongers coming uh, to Taiwan. Uh, now, uh, this kind of discussion about what to do about Hong Kongers in Taiwan has continued, uh, and uh, even though uh, we still kind of are, are seeing more and more Hong Kongers uh, moving to Taiwan, uh, there hasn't really been much of an institutional change uh, in Taiwan. Taiwan still has no refugee law, uh, has made it uh, explicitly clear that it will not uh, write or pass any sort of refugee law, uh, but it is doing what it can. Uh, to assist Hong Kongers in whatever various avenues. It's really come down much more to different civil society groups uh, reaching out to create pathways for Hong Kongers, whether it's uh, academia uh, or NGOs um, hiring Hong Kongers and making sure that they're able uh, to support themselves while they're in Taiwan. And uh, this became really a central uh, political issue during the 2020 election. Um, not just in uh, what do we do about Hong Kong, but uh, how should Taiwan respond uh, to kind of this uh, new national security law? And what does this really say about the future of Taiwan cross-strait relations? Uh, and I'd be very surprised if the issue of Hong Kong and Hong Kongers uh, does not stay in Taiwanese, the Taiwanese political spotlight uh, as the next midterm uh, and future presidential elections come around. Now, the final uh, uh, kind of data that I'll talk about um, is uh, our military anxieties. Um, it's uh, no shock that in the last uh, year or so, I, I think uh, uh, the Economist magazine cover that described Taiwan as uh, the most dangerous place on earth really kind of summarized this uh, pretty well. Uh, this idea that um, Taiwan's uh, potential for military conflict is becoming increasingly existential. Uh, and given the very unfortunate political reality that we live in today, uh, I think that anxiety has only built. Um, and what a lot of common wisdom says about Taiwanese civil society's response to military anxieties is that Taiwanese citizens are largely ambivalent uh, or that they're not particularly worried about evasion, that this idea of uh, military threat doesn't really phase them. Uh, and we were curious about that. And so, so we asked a, a host of questions about how Taiwanese felt about uh, military invasion. Uh, and so what we see is that 
uh, contrary to kind of this common wisdom that uh, there is much more worry about war than you might anticipate. Uh, a, a, over the majority of respondents felt that there uh, felt some amount of worry that there would be uh, a potential for war in the future. And what's particularly interesting is that this finding is very consistent across age cohorts. Um, what we originally anticipated is that uh, younger generations would be more worried and older generations would be less worried. Uh, but contrary to what we predicted, we actually found that older generations were slightly more worried about the potential for war than younger generations. Although younger generations still uh, all uh, consistently still felt um, some amount of worry. Um, this also goes back to how people uh, view uh, the PRC. Um, something that we were really curious to know about is whether or not Taiwanese were aware of a change in the PRC's military activity. Uh, because even though we see these kind of regular headlines in English and English language media about uh, PRC planes or military drills in Taiwan's air identification zone, uh, we very rarely uh, kind of hear about what the Taiwan uh, domestic response is to these types of military threats. And so what we were curious to know more about is whether or not people in Taiwan are actually aware, cognizantly aware of this kind of quantitative increase in military threats. And, and we find that they are. Uh, Taiwanese are perhaps more aware of their geopolitical surroundings than perhaps a lot of the discourse on military threats uh, in the United States gives credit for. Uh, but what we find is that overall they're, they're, they're not panicked uh, and that if uh, the everyday lives of Taiwanese civil society shows us anything is that uh, Taiwan has become very adept at kind of living in this very existential status uh, in spite of being aware of kind of its own precarious position. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, appraisals of the PRC government and how people feel about these issues is a very much a partisan uh, issue. Uh, DBP identifiers, of course, are much harsher uh, on the PRC government. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, the KM, people who identify with the KMT uh, are not nearly as pro PRC government as you might anticipate. Uh, in fact, people who identified with the KMT who saw the PRC government as, as uh, good for Taiwan is still relatively low. Uh, so to give a few concluding thoughts, uh, you know, perhaps the biggest uh, challenge with uh, the way that our, our data currently stands uh, is that a very big world event is happening and going on right now, which is, of course, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, all three of kind of these sets of questions, both uh, identity, how Taiwanese relate to China, how Taiwanese relate to the PRC and support uh, their own government versus the PRC, uh, how Taiwanese see Hong Kongers. Uh, and their desire to uh, move away from Hong Kong or their own precarious political struggle. Uh, and of course, uh, Chinese military threats. Uh, all three of these topics, uh, we reason to believe uh, responses might change uh, because of today's political context. Um, and every social scientist who studies political opinion uh, in Taiwan today is eagerly watching uh, to see how Taiwan civil society will respond uh, even before uh, the war began, we've seen a desire, especially from the Tsai government, uh, to really push for more uh, uh, military support domestically. Uh, during her 2020 uh, second inauguration, uh, after her second political victory, a big part of her campaign speech uh, was talking about the need for civil society uh, to support both the military and to be more engaged with military preparedness. Uh, and ever since then, we've seen a push uh, for uh, positive uh, political campaigns, for people to be more supportive of the military. Uh, and even ever since uh, the war in Ukraine started, you've now seen a renewed discussion about uh, Taiwan's mandated military service uh, and whether or not uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, own domestic reserves are enough or sufficient. Um, but how Ukraine uh, will affect public opinion in Taiwan is something that I think we're all eagerly awaiting to see more about. Um, I'd be very surprised uh, if uh, future public opinion does not change uh, to a degree because of it. Um, and we're very well aware of that. So our survey team is planning on conducting a second wave of this survey, uh, hopefully sometime uh, this summer. Um, we have a number of uh, different uh, survey experiments that we have connected uh, to each of these topics. Uh, we're continually interested in this idea of uh, solidarity between Taiwan and Hong Kongers, uh, and our future research will continue to look at how Taiwanese relate to Hong Kong and their linked fate. Uh, and we're also continuously interested in how Taiwanese feel about military threats. And future research, we plan uh, to conduct surveys uh, to better understand under what conditions Taiwanese uh, are more willing to express support for 
uh, military spending uh, and under what conditions uh, they're more likely to uh, express uh, their desire to uh, participate in emergency preparedness. Um, so uh, with that, I would like to thank you all uh, very much for your attention. Uh, these are all, uh, all the topics that we've, uh, that I've covered today are uh, in different uh, outlets uh, that I've published uh, in uh, three at the Brookings Institute and one in foreign policy. Uh, I didn't talk about the COVID uh, piece here, but if anyone has questions about uh, our COVID findings, I'm happy to uh, go into them uh, as well. And uh, thank you all very much for your time and attention. Lev, thank you very much. Uh, before I get to the questions and let me encourage people to uh, send in questions. Uh, and, and I'd like to add something to the in introduction that I uh, left out. Uh, the Hope Family Fellowship is a fellowship at uh, Harvard's Fairbank Center uh, donated by the Ho family to promote uh, Taiwan studies. Uh, it has a, a rather late deadline uh, of April 29th. So if there is anybody out there, the description of the qualifications are on the Fairbank uh, website. And we, we encourage you to uh, take advantage of the opportunity of applying. So to, to get to the business of the seminar, Lev, uh, your, your first <clears throat> point of, about, uh, the, uh, about Taiwan identity, not necessarily being uh, separate from Ch Chinese identity, um, still doesn't answer the question why people identify themselves as ta Taiwanese, uh, and and there are I, other kinds of uh, national identities other than uh, cultural national identities. Uh, there can be identity that's uh, based on on the political system, or on just uh, being identified with a particular kind of citizenship. Um, and, and, and so I, I, my, my sense is that uh, Taiwanese, particularly young Taiwanese, when they say they, they are Taiwan, Taiwanese, uh, Taiwan Ren, uh, they're saying more than uh, I'm, I'm not culturally Chinese. Uh, they're saying I'm, I'm a citizen of an entity uh, known as Taiwan, and I identify with that entity, my ethnicity is uh, secondary, uh, much like American citizenship. Yeah, I would, I would agree. I think, you know, uh, our, you know there, there are so many different interpretations uh, and re-understandings of what it means to be Taiwanese. Uh, and I think, you know, in the last, uh, you know, uh, five to 10 years, I think there's a kind of a growing discussion about uh, the, especially in English language discourse, finally. I mean, these discussions have been going on in Taiwan for decades. Um, but, you know, bringing up uh, how factors of uh, indigenous Taiwanese uh, or different uh, colonializations and their effect on Taiwanese identity, how all these kind of contribute to what Taiwanese culture is. Um, and, uh, you know, really what we're trying to say with our piece isn't to say what Taiwanese culture is or is not. Uh, or what Chinese culture is or is not. Um, rather to say that uh, kind of uh, attempts to frame the idea of Chinese culture as being a exclusive thing separate from Taiwanese culture that cannot be compatible. Uh, we don't really find survey support for that. Um, and when it comes to people identifying as Taiwanese as a political identity, I think that's most certainly true. I think the PRC has really pushed uh, Taiwanese citizens away from wanting to identify as Chinese because of the political connotations uh, that it has to be Chinese. But it's also not just about the PRC uh, because so much of Taiwanese identity is wrapped up in rejection from the ROC as well and rejection of the KMT uh, and kind of this uh, uh, longer history of uh, KM, the KMT's uh, role uh, in making Taiwan uh, more Chinese ever since uh, its kind of colonial era in, um, I think, you know, as much as it is about the PRC's uh, rejecting the PRC as a political entity, I don't think it's just about 
rejecting the PRC, but that this idea of reject, re, um, not identifying as Chinese is both a matter of rejecting the PRC, but also for many pro-Taiwan independence folks, uh, rejecting the ROC more so. Understood. Okay, uh, let, let me go to some of the questions from the audience. Um, one member of the audience writes, if unification is unpopular because of the nature of the CCP regime, uh, do we have data on how popular you, how popular unification uh, might be if Beijing had a democratic government? Uh, yeah, so you, you do see uh, more support for uh, the idea of unification if, de if China is democratic, but it's not a very big number. Uh, it only goes up, uh, I believe, to about uh, uh, 15, 20 percent, if that. Uh, and it really depends on how the question, that particular question is phrased. Um, more importantly, when it comes to uh, conducting surveys, asking uh, these counterfactual questions and hypothetical what ifs uh, is really kind of a, a um, it, they're very interesting uh, and they can tell us kind of interesting data point. Um, but uh, I always caution against kind of uh, putting too much weight into these hypothetical what ifs uh, because especially the idea of if China was a democracy, would you support unification? Uh, in our political context, in the world we live in, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, and I would say that anyone who thinks that China is on the verge of a democratic transition is probably not particularly paying attention to what's happening in the world today. So when we ask a survey question that asks this hypothetical, uh, if China was democratic, uh, would we would, would unification, uh, the support for unification increase? It's interesting to ask the question, but how much weight it actually has in how people would uh, politically behave, uh, I think is rather minimal. Okay, another set of questions, or, or one question rather, uh, on military anxieties. How much do the Taiwanese people expect the US military to step in to defend the island from mainland incursions? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and when it comes to uh, why are Taiwanese not more supportive of public spending on, on military, um, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of reasons ranging from, you know, historic institutional support for the military being a much more pan blue institution. Um, but, you know, another key reason is that a lot of Taiwanese feel that the United States would step in no matter what. So when it comes to the idea of saying we should spend more money and we should spend uh, and we should be more attentive of domestic emergency preparedness, you often hear responses of why the United States is, is going to help us pretty much no matter what. Uh, and that's not true. Uh, I think the United States regularly tries to make it very well known uh, that Taiwan does not have a blank check from the United States military. Um, and I think a big reason, and I, I, the, the DPP government is fully well aware of this. I think a lot of the reason why Tsai has been pushing uh, for more of civil society to have support for the military uh, is to try to push away from this idea that, the, that Taiwan uh, can simply rely on the United States' intervention in the event of a military conflict. I might just uh, make a note that uh, the Taiwan Public Opinion Foundation uh, just did a survey maybe two or three days ago on the likelihood of um, American intervention to assist Taiwan and Japanese intervention to assist Taiwan. And they found that uh, the people who they surveyed uh, were more optimistic that there would be a Japanese intervention than an American intervention. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a really uh, yes. interesting. It's it's it, it, Japan is increasing is less so these days, but has historically really been left out of these conversations about what happens during some sort of uh, military incursion uh, in the Taiwan Strait. Um, and I think uh, you know, just days ago, uh, Tsai met with former Prime Minister Abe, um, and I think you you really see uh, the Japanese Taiwanese relationship growing even stronger uh, ever since kind of the increase in uh, jets flying into Taiwan's air identification zone. Um, and I think ta Taiwanese are aware of, of kind of that strong Japanese friendship. Uh, and I think public opinion is really reflecting that. Another question. Uh, 
two-part question. Uh, do you specify what you mean by culture, Wenhua? Ethnic, artistic, political, national, family, respect for education, etc. Secondly, does Beijing care at all about the sort of findings you and others have found? Does Putin care what the Ukrainians think about reunification? Um, so uh, in our survey, we don't specify what we mean by culture. Uh, and from a survey uh, design perspective, uh, if we were to do a really, <coughs> excuse me, a really deep dive into the understanding of culture, we would spend an entire separate survey just on these kind of measurements of family uh, relationship to each other, government. Uh, and there's surveys that do that. Um, we used, uh, we simply said Wenhua uh, in our survey. Um, and if there was a critique to be made against uh, our understanding of, uh, of, of our results, uh, it's, I think that's a very valid critique is to say that we don't specify what we mean by culture and we leave it up to the respondent uh, to specify. Unfortunately, uh, when it comes to understanding something like culture, um, which uh, I think plenty of social scientists would agree is a really big concept, uh, surveys are not always uh, perfect at telling us what exactly uh, culture means. Uh, and when you do use uh, culture in a survey question or response like this, uh, you're kind of uh, having to accept some amount of imperfect measurement uh, because culture can be interpreted in so many different ways depending on who's responding. Um, but that's why we were at the very least specific about saying Zhongguo Wenhua as opposed to Zhonghua Wenhua um, to make it very specific that we're talking about Zhongguo as in the PRC. Oh, as for the second part of your question about whether or not uh, she cares about uh, these results, um, you know, I, I, I I didn't get to it, uh, but in our in our COVID uh, research, uh, we talk about how uh, Taiwan is thoroughly unimpressed by the PRC's COVID response, uh, and this is interesting because you know China has really been on the offensive with its PR campaign to say, look at how good China has been about handling COVID. Of course, up until kind of these recent outbreaks, um, and you know trying to argue that China has found a new form of Chinese democracy that other states uh, around the world should be modeling, um, and Taiwan hasn't bought that at all. Uh, our surveys show that uh, Taiwanese uh, largely blame China for the pandemic and are not in favor of seeing them any more favorably uh, because of their response. Um, now, that tells us that, you know, she's uh, attempts to try to improve China's image globally are not working in Taiwan. Uh, and what she really is trying to do, arguably, uh, is to try to make unification more appealing uh, to Taiwan. Um, whether or not he's paying attention, I don't know. Uh, but if there was something for him to pay attention to, it's that a lot of the PRC's attempts to make unification appealing to Taiwan are not working. Uh, and the more that military threats occur, uh, the less likely that's going to happen. Um, which is all to say that uh, you know, we, we know that, event, that unification is the goal for the PRC um, and that the PRC is hoping to do so without having to actually go to war. Um, but their attempts at navigating that path are becoming increasingly fraught uh, the more that they make uh, kind of uh, the steps that they have. Another question. Uh, has enough time passed for real independent Taiwanese culture to develop distinctly, distinct, distinct from the PRC? Uh, that's a hard question to say. Um, uh, how much time has to pass for a, cult, for a culture to develop, I feel like is a really fraught question that really is contextualized based off what you're talking about. Um, Taiwanese, ident Taiwanese culture and culture on Taiwan has existed long before there was ever such an entity known as uh, the PRC um, or the ROC. Uh, I mean, indigenous Taiwanese culture dates back centuries uh, and you have different versions of Taiwanese culture developing uh, as each era of Taiwan has progressed. Um, the idea of contemporary Taiwanese culture, Taiwanese culture as it exists uh, in 2022, um, really is uh, this sort of uh, hybrid of, uh, his, of different colonialism cultures uh, and of Taiwan's own unique indigenous cultures kind of coming together. Um, whether or not it is uh, separate enough or fully separate from any other state, I think is something to be, that, that could be debated, but that's not really uh, something I feel like I can say uh, with any sort of certainty. I guess we should note that uh, as far as the mainland is concerned, uh, Taiwan is 
is abandoning uh, Ch Chinese culture uh, in the in the uh, promotion of Taiwan history, Taiwan language, uh, museum exhibitions, etc. Uh, they they do perceive that as part of the the package of uh, DPP independence orientation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a central talking point of PRC propaganda. Uh, and if there was one report that I wish she would read uh, is that, you know, our findings that Taiwanese don't reject the idea of Chinese culture, uh, or at the very least, I wish that there was uh, more understanding of this kind of idea that uh, the rejection of Chinese culture is not this kind of, kind of uh, binary Taiwanese or Chinese cultural divide that I think a lot of the PRC propaganda presents uh, uh, for its own domestic audience. But Lev, does it, does it really make any difference uh, whether they accept Chinese culture or not? They, they identify with, with Taiwan. Uh, you know, from different perspectives, I think of something like civil society relations. Um, you know, I think it's important for uh, maintaining, uh, you know, good ties uh, between Chinese civil society and Taiwanese civil society. Uh, to be able to show uh, and push back against this kind of uh, PRC perspective that Taiwan is rejecting and uh, uh, anti-Chinese culture, this kind of anti-Chinese cultural message that I think you touched on. Um, you know, I think that, you know, in terms of uh, Taiwan's soft power, it's really important uh, uh, and does make a difference. You know, whether or not it matters for Xi, probably not. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there are trickle down effects uh, to uh, making it explicit that Taiwan is not anti-Chinese culture and that Taiwan is not anti chineseness uh, it's just its relationship with Chineseness is different than how people in the PRC relate to it, but it's not a rejection. It's just a different uh, understanding and interpretation of it. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, any hypothesis in regard to the least favorable impression of the PRC and identity with Taiwan culture for the 30 to 39 year olds? Yeah, I would say that's, so that's the sunflower generation, essentially. So the, the 2014 sunflower movement um, was, was a watershed political protest in Taiwan uh, that really kind of shaped a generation's understanding of what it means to be Taiwanese uh, and their relation and perspective on China. Uh, and that 30 to 39 year old generation, that's, that's kind of the cohort of folks who grew up and participated in the sunflower movement. Um, a lot of people might think that the 20 to 29 year old uh, age group is also part of the sunflower generation. Uh, but uh, Shelly Rigger actually has some really cool research that she did when conducting a Fulbright a year or so ago that shows that there really is sort of a generational divide essentially between Taiwanese millennials and Taiwanese Gen Z. Uh, Taiwanese millennials kind of being the sunflower generation and Taiwanese Gen Z kind of being a post sunflower generation that actually doesn't have the same kind of uh, sunflower uh, uh, experience and politics that the 30 to 39 year old uh, cohort does. So because of the sun, because of that kind of generational effect, uh, I'm, I, I, that's at least how I understand the 30 to 39 year old uh, generational cohort being slightly lower and why the 20 to 29 year old generational cohort being slightly higher. Okay. Um, one of the audience writes, in the poll data, it appears that Taiwan respondents have a rather low view of mainland people along with the PRC government. Can you speak on this? Uh, yeah, so we, we actually did a, a bigger uh, questionnaire about uh, people's perceptions of uh, different uh, national groups across uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, and perception of Chinese people is still relatively low. Uh, and this is most certainly uh, something to keep an eye on and something that's somewhat concerning. Uh, you know, a, a common theme that uh, I know we talk about when it comes to studying Chinese politics or critiquing the Chinese government is that, you know, it, the people are, are separate from the government. Um, and I think that's something that, uh, uh, it, it's a message that I think uh, perhaps uh, could be uh, echoed a bit more in Taiwan. Um, but seeing these kind of low perceptions of Chinese people along with the government uh, is not completely surprising, uh, only because uh, perceptions of uh, Chinese people being supportive of the PRC's politics towards Taiwan, I think, really kind of drives Taiwanese perceptions uh, of Chinese citizens. The idea being that Chinese citizens support the PRC's uh, 
uh, uh, attitude of wanting to invade and unify Taiwan, or that Chinese citizens don't take Taiwanese, uh, do not see Taiwanese as equal uh, citizens of the world, uh, or just kind of other negative understandings of how Chinese people see ta Taiwanese people, I think really kind of drives this negative uh, perception of Chinese people in Taiwan. And I think the biggest solution to that is uh, civil society ties uh, and uh, meaningful uh, um, uh, interactions between Taiwanese and Chinese people. Um, but of course, that's incredibly difficult um, when uh, that's, uh, you know, first and foremost because of the pandemic, uh, but also because uh, Xi Jinping won't have any sort of uh, civil society ties with Taiwan while there's a TPP president. Um, despite size, many attempts at reaching out to Xi to try to open up ties. Well, but Lev, during, during the period when there was relatively uh, a lot of Chinese tourism uh, to Taiwan, uh, my impression is that it didn't build a lot of self-respect or, or uh, mutual respect, rather. Yeah, I think it, it really has to do with kind of the quality of the interaction. Uh, and the type of interaction. So, you know, there's kind of like the stereotype of Chinese tour buses being loud and rambunctious. Um, but those Chinese people weren't really interacting with Taiwanese full society. Um, there's a great book forthcoming by Ian Rowan who talks kind of about uh, the, the Taiwan that Chinese tourists actually experience and how it's very separate from Taiwan, uh, at least the Taiwan that Taiwanese experience and live in. Uh, and I think that really kind of uh, points to this idea that uh, just because there were Chinese people in Taiwan before doesn't mean that people were actually interacting in a meaningful way. Um, and that those interactions perhaps uh, were not nearly as productive as they perhaps could have been. Um, for example, you know, I hear stories of, you know, Taiwanese and Chinese, Chinese uh, solo travelers in Taiwan having very positive uh, experiences in Taiwan with Taiwanese people uh, and people who are not on these big tour buses. Um, but of course, you know, Chinese people's ability to solo travel in Taiwan varies on their domestic kuko, and that's a whole other uh, complicated uh, issue. Um, so whether or not we can actually see these kinds of interactions in the future, I think it's just going to be really tough to, to know. A question from the audience. Uh, could you talk about the Taiwanese hesitancy with regard to Hong Kong refugees and refugee policy generally? Is it to avoid antagonizing <coughs> the RC? So it's interesting. Um, the official reason that Tsai Ing-wen gives about why uh, they can't accept refuge uh, too many Hong Kongers, or they can't be too loud about helping Hong Kongers, is because they don't want to upset China. Um, and uh, you know that's interesting because on, on some issues the DPP and Tsai will be very loud about kind of pushing the boundaries. For example, I think like Mike Pompeo's visit is a good example of them kind of really pushing the boundaries. Uh, but when, when it comes to something like helping Hong Kong refugees, that's definitely too far uh, in terms of pushing the boundaries. Um, and that can be very frustrating, especially for civil society groups in Taiwan that are really pushing for more pathways to uh, for Hong Kongers. Um, there is a great piece uh, in the uh, Taiwanese news outlet, uh, Bao Daozi, uh, uh, the reporter, that actually uh, did a deep dive on a Hong Kong civil society group in Taiwan uh, that pushed for a simplification of uh, the pathways to uh, residency in Taiwan for Hong Kongers. So currently there's like 15 steps for Hong Kongers to get residency in Taiwan. It's really complicated. And the civil society group designed this whole plan to simplify that process. And it was flat out rejected. It at least hasn't gone anywhere. Um, and any sort of attempt, this, this was back at kind of the uh, earlier on in the anti-extradition protests uh, a number of uh, smaller political parties uh, really pushed the DPP uh, to create some sort of institutional pathway um, through a refugee law to help Hong Kongers. And the DPP made it explicitly clear multiple times that it would not, uh, not only would it not write a refugee law, but that uh, the existing pathways for Hong Kongers, they said was sufficient. Um, now, I think there's a lot of uh, worry about if Taiwan was to open a sort of refugee law pathway, uh, what the influx of people, especially people from China that would try to flee to Taiwan, what that would potentially do. And the kind of political uh, um, uh, um, uh, how that might kind of hurt Taiwan's 
uh, cross strait status and uh, internet and kind of regional status. Um, and you kind of hear horror stories of, for example, there were uh, Chinese dissidents that tried to flee to Taiwan uh, that just like refused to get back on the plane and Taiwan still ended up uh, sending them back to, to China anyway. Um, so, you, you, you know, to, why exactly Taiwan doesn't want a refugee law, um, I think is kind of a complicated issue uh, that really revolves around not wanting to create too many pathways uh, for people to come into Taiwan, because I think uh, uh, it's just a really politically fraught thing to have a lot of refugees in a place that is still contested. Um, but I can recommend uh, Maggie Lewis has written quite a bit uh, about Taiwan's refugee law uh, and what and the lack thereof, uh, and kind of how refugees are able to navigate Taiwan. Um, but. We have a four part question. Test your memory, Lev. Uh, do you have data on the following? What is the Taiwanese people's common perception of Hong Kongers? Two, is that perception based on personal relationships or experience with Hong Kongers? Three, what are those perceptions? Are they mostly positive or negative? And four, to what extent do those perceptions affect the lack of support for Hong Kongers to move to Taiwan? Can you read the last one again real quick, please? Yeah. <laughs> you remember the first three? Yeah. Uh, to what extent do these perceptions affect their lack of support for Hong Kongers to move to Taiwan? Uh, so they have very, so, so again, we asked a whole battery of different uh, nationalities and Taiwanese percept, uh, support for them. Um, Hong Kongers are very high. So Taiwanese see Hong Kongers in a relatively good uh, light, um, but that still doesn't mean that uh, they're willing to kind of allow Hong Kongers to move into Taiwan. Um, now, why, why exactly the, they have good opinions of Hong Kongers? Uh, we can't really say our survey doesn't uh, kind of have data for that. Um, so whether or not it's personal ties or some sort of other perception of Hong Kongers isn't something I can answer. Um, you know, really what we find uh, with regards to how Taiwanese feel about Hong Kong and Hong Kongers is, you know, Taiwan really saw uh, the complete kind of degrading of Hong Kong civil society throughout the 2019 extradition protests. Uh, and with the introduction of the national security law, kind of really uh, the autocratization of Hong Kong. And I think for a lot of Taiwanese, they saw that and you know, they all thought that's bad and we definitely don't want that. We don't want one country, two systems. We don't want what's happening in Hong Kong to happen to Taiwan. But uh, we don't necessarily know that we need to be the ones to help Hong Kong, um, at least more than our capacity really allows us to. Uh, and uh, you know, the reasons why there's, the, it, it, you know, the, it, we don't find that Taiwanese don't want to help Hong Kongers. Our findings is that it varies. You have plenty of Taiwanese that do. Uh, and I would actually be particularly interested, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting our next wave of these questions done. Uh, I, for anyone who's been following this in Taiwan, uh, the, the uh, documentary on the Hong Kong protests uh, has become the new uh, box office breaker in Taiwan. It set records in Taiwan for being the most, uh, I think the most seen new movie uh, um, I'm going to get the fact wrong, but, but it, anyway, it's, it's, it's become extremely widely watched all around Taiwan. Uh, and I'm very curious to see if uh, our numbers for support for actions for Hong Kongers will change um, one year later, especially now that uh, this documentary has really become uh, so uh, prevalent in Taiwan. There's a really interesting uh, social movement uh, studies paper that finds that uh, screening documentaries uh, increase, can, can actually increase uh, support for different for political causes. Um, and I think uh, I'd be curious to see uh, how kind of perceptions uh, of whether or not Taiwan should help Hong Kongers has changed uh, in light of just these last couple of months. Okay. Um, well, there's one request uh, regarding the sunflower movement. Well, what book would you recommend for understanding the sunflower movement? I would say uh, Ming Shouhou's uh, Huning Xiu. Uh, his book titled uh, Challenging Be uh, Beijing's Band-Aid of Heaven. Um, that's definitely uh, so far uh, the best sunflower book. I would also recommend 
uh, a new edited volume that came out of uh, University of California Press last year, uh, Sunflowers and Umbrellas, that was edited, co-edited by uh, Sebastian Vague and Tom Gold. That's a collection of scholarship on the Sunflower Movement and the Umbrella Movement. Um, and then uh, I would recommend uh, Ian Rowan has an article in uh, the Journal of Asian Studies of his uh, actual experience participating in the Sunflower Movement. Uh, and then uh, finally, I would recommend, uh, there's a website called Daybreak uh, that's made by a uh, organization, organization in Taiwan called New Bloom that has a extremely detailed timeline uh, and description of the Sunflower Movement, along with hundreds of interviews from activists and organizers from the Sunflower Movement. Uh, that's a really valuable resource for learning more. Lev, not everybody knows what the Sunflower Movement was. So could you say a couple words about that and how it relates to this uh, uh, the the underlying uh, assumptions of your survey? Sure. Uh, so uh, in 2014, uh, this bill called the Cross-Strait Service Trade Agreement uh, was passed in Taiwan. And this bill was largely controversial for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, it was negotiated behind closed doors in Shanghai between representatives of uh, Taiwan and the PRC. Uh, and a lot of perceptions in Taiwan was that this bill was not good for Taiwan, that it disproportionately advantaged China, that China was going to be able to really take advantage of Taiwan's uh, uh, economic growth, and that Taiwan would be economically put into this kind of black box in which uh, it would be unable to escape from China's kind of course of economic grasp. Uh, so that's controversial reason number one. Controversial reason number two is that the bill was passed uh, it, without proper review. Uh, so the, the incident was, was infamously known as the 32nd incident in which the KMT passed this trade bill without actually going through uh, the, the proper democratic means to passing such a, a, a large bill. Uh, and this combination uh, really kind of set off what was a growing powder keg uh, of social activism in Taiwan at the time. Kind of ever since Ma ying came into power in 2008, you see a, a, an increase in social movement activity in Taiwan. And the Sunfire Movement is really kind of this culmination of a lot of anxieties uh, towards China and towards kind of this growing uh, course of approach, uh, reproach between Taiwan and China. Uh, and so after this bill passes, you have this very large protest that takes place all around Taiwan, but mainly in Taipei. Uh, for three weeks, uh, you had uh, activists occupying Taiwan's legislative UN. Uh, and uh, the, the, the movement um, eventually stopped the bill, so the bill was shelved. Uh, and activists withdrew. And it's uh, in terms of just kind of the, the movement's immediate outcomes, it was uh, seen as somewhat of a success because it was able to stop the bill. Um, but this really kind of brought a lot of uh, important cultural and political, cult political culture uh, moments to the forefront in Taiwan, specifically uh, Taiwanese identity, uh, fears of China, um, and what Taiwan's kind of role is going to be going forward. Um, it was really a watershed moment for Taiwanese politics. After the Sunflower Movement, uh, something that my dissertation looks at, you see a whole new cohort of uh, political parties that form out of the Sunflower Movement. Uh, and you start to see the DPP uh, becoming much more electorally successful than it was before the Sunflower Movement. Um, and arguably a lot of uh, the trends and directions that we see in Taiwan today, and it's kind of push for pro-Taiwan politics uh, and pro-Taiwanese sovereignty really begin with the Sunflower Movement in 2014. Um, it really, if, if, if in order to understand why Taiwan uh, is in the place that it is today, it's one of those fundamental events that you really have to understand. Thanks. I apologize again for my voice. I know I probably sound much more hoarse and uh, dark than I mean to. But logical. Uh, question, uh, to what extent do you believe that the reunification by force is inevitable given the stance of the Xi administration towards Taiwan? Definitely not inevitable. Um, and uh, I think anyone who thinks uh, that a big conflict over Taiwan is inevitable um, uh, is, is uh, perhaps being a bit too glass half empty. Um, you know, if uh, it, the PRC can, can tolerate Taiwan's de facto uh, independence as it exists today. So Taiwan is not formally independent. It's, it's de facto independent, meaning that uh, it exists separately from the PRC, but it is not considered to be a separate country uh, by, the, by international order. Um, and this very kind of uncomfortable gray zone that Taiwan exists in is not perfect for the PRC and it's not perfect for Taiwan. 
but it's something that she can accept. Uh, and so long as uh, this kind of uh, ambiguous status is maintained, there's no need for she or the PRC to go to war over Taiwan. Uh, it really serves as a, a fundamental driver for uh, legitimacy and authority within the PRC. Um, it's a rally around the flag, excuse me, issue that uh, she regularly refer, uh, utilizes. Um, and uh, there's plenty of uh, good reasons to suspect that uh, war uh, is not likely to happen uh, in, the, in, in the short term. Now, of course, this is not to say that war might not happen. Uh, there's plenty of good reasons to suspect that war might happen in the future. Um, and I think those are very valid reasons, uh, especially I think given the geopolitical context we live in today, whether or not the likelihood of war over uh, Taiwan has increased or decreased, I think is up for debate. Um, but the idea of it being inevitable, I would definitely disagree with. But the pessimist would say that uh, she has tied reunification with Taiwan to his legacy and to his vision of a future China. Yeah, but we don't really know um, uh, what that necessarily means or looks like. I know, I think a lot of people are looking for the next, for the next uh, People's Congress when she is apparently going to outline his new direction for Taiwan or attitude towards Taiwan. I think we'll have a better understanding of what exactly his intentions are. Um, but thinking back, uh, to uh, a double 10 day this last year when the PRC did a whole event for a double 10 day and uh, was speaking specifically about Taiwan. Uh, I know that a lot of us were really worried about what exactly Xi Jinping was going to say about Taiwan uh, and whether or not this would be the moment that Xi would really up his rhetoric and, and really become much more aggressive in, in how he presents his uh, goals for Taiwan. But that's not what happened uh, and instead we heard she use a lot of the same peaceful unification, uh, uh, you know, peaceful integration. We need uh, both sides of the strait need to, you know, uh, future cooperation. Um, we didn't see an increase in, in kind of the harshness of his rhetoric. Um, and until we kind of see a change in how he talks about Taiwan to his domestic audience, uh, I don't think that, a, uh, that he is necessarily planning on invasion in, in, in kind of the short near term. Of course, there are situations that might lead to that, that are external to that. But I think from the very least, looking at Xi's own words, it does not seem like that is necessarily uh, uh, a major priority for him right now. The idea of his legacy, maybe, um, but I, I would dare not predict anything more than uh, six months to two years out of where we are right now. Okay. Uh, what's happening with the Taiwan-based chip industry? Uh, semiconductor industry. Um, uh, it mostly, it, I mean, it's certainly become uh, a major talking point for uh, why uh, unification is unlikely because of China knows its reliance on the Taiwanese chip market, uh, or at the very least, uh, other countries have a reliance on Taiwan's chip market and that this might be some sort of deterrent. Um, I've heard arguments both that that is a good argument for deterrent and that that necessarily doesn't really uh, have as much deterrence as we might anticipate. Um, at the very least, I think, you know, it's well known that, uh, you know, TS, TSMC uh, is one of the most important companies in Taiwan. Uh, and that, you know, Morris Chang is most certainly aware of kind of the geopolitical circumstances uh, that his company exists in today. Uh, and TSMC is uh, not, you know, I, I think it, it often gets a reputation of being more pan green because he's been size representative at a number of international um, uh, organizational economic meetings. But TSMC has factories in China. Uh, they, they have a factory in Nanjing, I know for certain. Um, and TSMC is, is, is very much one of these uh, businesses that is tied on both sides of the street. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, uh, it, it most certainly, from that perspective, I think helps deter conflict just because I think it's helping uh, make sure that both sides see the war it would inevitably be very bad for everyone. Another question, uh, is this really a cultural discussion or more a dispute over government and ruling style and system? After all, most of the Taiwanese people are of pure Chinese origins and, and are not indigenous to the island, 
and have gone there because they did not want to be communists in 1949. And how is it being affected now that China is probably more capitalistic than the US, albeit without the freedom and individuality? Uh, I would push back on that premise a little bit um, because uh, the majority of Han Chinese, uh, Han ethnicity people in Taiwan are not actually post 49 uh, wisely. The, the vast majority of, of Han people in Taiwan were there before uh, the, the Chinese Civil War. Um, and the exact amount of uh, integration, you know, identifying uh, a nationality purely based off of your ethnic background, I think is not really something that uh, uh, dictates directly a cultural identity. Uh, that people can have cultural identities regardless of their ethnic makeup. Um, and uh, there's a lot of very good uh, social science research that shows that support for different governances uh, or support for how your politics work is a question of culture. Uh, and that you can't really separate the idea of support for different types of governances or uh, support for uh, democratic values from, a, from cultural values and that these are very much interlinked. Um, <clears throat> so rather than kind of see these as uh, kind of separate uh, issues, I would say that um, it's, it's, it's a much uh, more linked between uh, politics and culture than, uh, than, than um, we might anticipate. Reflecting on the relative lack of significant differences in attitude towards the PRC across generational cohorts, did your survey ask about personal experiences in China, travel, employment, study, et cetera? Could you comment on how generational differences regarding the extent and quality of direct contact might influence these attitudes? Um. Great question. Uh, we did ask if they had any experience traveling uh, to China. Um, and I'm going to very quickly, no, of course, I can't find the window. Um, we, we, we did ask uh, because we were curious if that had any effect. I can't tell you uh, at this moment um, if uh, how that kind of uh, uh, influences the other kind of response that they have. Um, but uh, it is something that we're interested in about whether or not kind of uh, experiences in China change people's perceptions uh, of China. Um, in the future, it's definitely something that I think uh, people would be interested in uh, knowing more about the idea of if Taiwanese have experience in China, how or whether or not that influences their own domestic politics. Um, I think there's actually a, a uh, bit of a common misunderstanding that uh, Taiwanese who do business in China or Taiwanese that go to China must inevitably be more pro-China or pan blue or identify with the KMT. Uh, and that's, uh, I would argue, that's probably not very uh, necessarily true, um, that there's plenty of DPP politicians who are not pro-China, who still go to China to do business, um, uh, not because of any sort of uh, tie to the PRC, but uh, personal tie to the PRC, but because they see it as just a lucrative uh, business opportunity, separate from their own political identity. Do you see any lasting impact of the months when Clubhouse was open as a platform to allow cross-strait mm. communication? Uh, no, but that was a great moment, I think. Um, for those unfamiliar, Clubhouse was a uh, cell phone application uh, in which it was, a, it was like a, a chat room, but uh, audio only. Um, and there was this very cool moment where uh, you had people from the PRC uh, in direct conversation with people from Taiwan and you heard and you could listen to people from Taiwan and people from China talking through uh, cross-strait politics and their own perceptions of cross-strait politics in real time. And it was a very cool moment that I think uh, led to more understanding of each other. And uh, those are the kinds of interactions that I think are very valuable. Um, and, uh, you know, whether or not that had any sort of lasting effect, I, I don't know. Um, but uh, I, it definitely was a nice moment thinking back on it. Okay, Lev, I, th I think we're gonna let you rest your voice uh, and thank you very much uh, for your participation and thank you very much for the time that you're spending at the Fairbank Center. Thank you, Steve, it's really been wonderful. 
and thank you to the audience. Uh, we will next month uh, have a presentation by another Ho Fellow, and uh, I hope you'll be able to join us. Until then, um, let's hope for peace in the Taiwan Strait. Thanks, Lab. Thank you so much, Park. I'll see you in the office. Absolutely.